took part in the cultural movement in Mozambique and we had many people in exile from Chile and many had been involved in Unidad Popular in public art and Mozambique was poverty stricken with uh, war, civil war, famine, but fighting for something new, something precious, something we hadn't achieved yet in South Africa, had a huge emotional investment in arts and artists, and it was quite marvelous to have artists from all over the world there. And I actually painted together with the Unidad Popular, I had never painted in my life before, put my brush in, in a little pot of paint and followed a line made by Malangatana, a flower, and I felt, wow, fantastic, I've helped paint on a public building. And that is, in a way, central to what I'm going to talk about uh, today. It, it's, it's about dreams, it's about method, it's about madness, and how these three kind of come together. And it's about relationships. When we started the South African Constitutional Court. It was a brand new building, a new institution created to defend our new constitutional democracy. Parliament went into Parliament, new people in Parliament, the same building. The President went into Nelson Mandela Union Buildings, this wonderful, uh, confident, uh, imperial, splendid building in Pretoria. We had nothing. And everybody on the court was given a task. It's 11 excited people, judges of the Constitutional Court, and somebody had the rules of the court, somebody else the library, somebody computers. When they ran out of task, somebody else the gown, there was Yvonne Mohor and L.B. Sachs left, and they gave us decor. <laughs> and they gave us 10,000 rand, which was then worth about 1,000 pounds. And it turned out to be our biggest blessing because we had nothing, 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 except a revolution, a huge social transformation, expectations that were unlimited, and the dreams, if you like, that certainly I had and others had from the days of Mozambique, earlier in the struggle in South Africa when we actually painted one mural that was painted over by the security police afterwards. The dreams of doing something lasting, something public, something significant, something as special in terms of a public place as our constitution was as a constitution. Something as innovatory in terms of transformation and change as our constitution was, this racist, authoritarian, bitter state and society into a generous, open, caring, warm, as you said, non-racial, non-sexist society with careful structures, with a bill of rights, uh, with the checks and balances to prevent these things from happening again. Something equally splendid, equally significant, equally special, but also equally rooted in our history, our imagination, our topography, our landscape, both physical landscape, climatic landscape, but also our cultural landscape. And not something that would be just a pastiche, a little bit of Cape Dutch, a little bit of Zulu beehive, a little bit of uh, Mock Tudor, which was the great fashion in Johannesburg, in, I think in, in the 30s, as a sort of a new kind of diverse South Africanism, something that emerged from the very character of our new society in which there would be the investment, uh, the, the commitment, the passion, the obsession, the love, the hope, the anxieties, the fears, all could be poured into that symbol of our new democracy which would be a physical presence, a building called the Constitutional Court. And the big advantage we had with nothing was we could invent ourselves. We could establish from the beginning. Normally when you take over an institution, even when you take over that extraordinarily huge Sheffield thing, which at the time would have been the pride of progressives, and now people say we stuck with it, you know, what are we going to do with it? Uh, you come into a building and if it has anything at all connected with the law, it will have pictures of dead white male judges. 
Now one day I'm going to be a dead white male judge, so I can't have any objection to that. But that simple picture, one picture on a wall, one picture, that's all, is telling a huge story. It's saying men counted and whites counted. We didn't want to simply follow that. You could copy the old Bailey or the uh, Supreme Court in America, which itself was an idealized copy of a beautiful, classical, rational kind of a building. Or you could go for something which would really be ours, deeply, intrinsically, powerfully, passionately, emotionally, aesthetically ours. Now, how do you get that? What links the method, the madness, the dreams, the relationships? It's process. It would be so easy to say the wonderful Janina and Andy met, who had a great social awareness and conscience, met the wonderful L.B. Sachs. Wow, gee whiz, a judge who's interested in art and architecture and everything followed from that. And that would be to trivialize something that's much more profound, much more translatable, transportable than what actually happened. Process turned out to be absolutely central to the whole relationship between what's called the, the client and, and the architects and the whole manner in which from this nothing, from this zero, from this void, but in a very uh, specific, highly specific place in our country and moment in our history, how this thing emerged. And the first part of the process was the judges ourselves. We had to develop a way of working it wasn't just one person coming up with an idea, pushing it through, and collectively the 11 of us would discuss how to go about things. And the very first thing we had to do was a logo. I mean, nothing could be better for a design conference than to say the new Constitutional Court of South Africa commenced its work by designing a logo. The old logo, it wasn't all that ugly. It was a Europeanized kind of a thing with some African... Uh, elements introduced, I think a lion and a unicorn and, and quite a neat little thing. No one remembers it because it had nothing specific about it. Not, it wasn't unpleasant, it was just nothing. And we couldn't bear it because that logo would be on the death sentence warrants, it would be on the banning orders, it would be the group areas evictions, that symbol of the old state. We felt we couldn't allow a single letter to go out from the Constitutional Court with that old symbol on it. Even though there was nothing ugly in the symbol itself, the associations were totally uh, unacceptable. Now what should the logo of the new Constitutional Court be? And in determining that logo, everything else followed from that. Everything else. Because we ended up with a tree with people under the tree. The tree is the constitution, the people check the constitution, the constitution shelters the people. I think it happens to be a rather brilliant design that's, that's working well, it's, it's specific, it identifies us uh, quite strongly, it's, it's unique to the institution and somehow it's become very familiar and acceptable. But it's as interesting for what it's not it's not the blindfolded woman with the scales of justice. It's not Roman columns. It's not an imported idea to say, hey, world, we are civilized. We've joined the ranks of the great legal people throughout the world. It's expressing our pride. We fought for our constitution. We got our constitution. We've got our court that's there to defend the constitution. And we're going to have our own symbol, our own representation, our own image that will capture and project and add something to who we are and what we are. And when it came to the next phase of process, we decided we needed, obviously, our own building. And I might say the very first artwork that we have, and it's so interesting, you've got bare walls. What's the first picture you put up? That touch. It's that da-da-da-da. It's the only way Beethoven could have started the Fifth Symphony. And what are we going to say with that very first image that you see as you get out of the lift coming to the Constitutional Court? And Cecil Scottness, whom the South Africans would know, who's done a lot of public art, happened to say very shyly there's a work he'd, be, he'd done in 
uh, in his excitement and joy at the achievement of democracy, and very shyly he said, would we be interested in receiving it? Would we be interested? And of course it was a very special work painted on wood and I said, can you get an African artist to work with you so that our first work somehow is seen as not only people from the privileged community in the past, but people who didn't have opportunities. He worked with Hamilton Bazard um, and, and they made a lovely kind of a triptych. And it's very difficult to say where his work begins and ends where Hamilton's work begins and ends and it went up and I was nervous. How would people take it? In a court? Is this what the Constitutional Court is going to be about? And some of my colleagues were quite nervous but then public reaction at least from the RT people, people like ourselves, was so positive, they were so excited not to see a stale symbol that it gave courage to the Chief Justice and to the others. And this rather negative idea, art for art's sake, leave it to Albie, aesthetics, that's his thing, we leave it to him. Uh, that rather unacceptable principle em enabled us to get through. The next thing was choosing the site. The judges chose the site of the old Fort Prison, which had been decommissioned in Johannesburg. Now that's powerful. You're putting up a building in the site of an old prison. You're taking the negativity, the intense negativity, we say with that strange pride. We have the only prison in the world where both Gandhi and Mandela were locked up. No one else can make that claim. And we're going to put our new constitutional court right in the heart of that. A fantastic challenge to the imagination, to architects, to the city, to lawyers. We lawyers tend to be very formalistic, very traditional, very conventional. Even the most progressive revolutionary lawyers in many respects, in all sorts of ways, are quite conventional in their thinking and their imagery. And so that already was sending out a very, very powerful message to anybody entering. And we spent almost a year designing the brief. And the people who designed the brief, that was inclusive. This is where process comes in. You had to have a feeling that this is a national project involving the city of Johannesburg, the heritage component, the public works component, the court, the black architects, the more formal mainstream architects associations, Optaku, all these different groups were involved. It takes longer. City Council, very big role. It takes much, much longer. But in the end, you're getting a kind of a consensus. And the excitement ripples out a little bit. And there's much more support for the final product. And we established the character of the building that we wanted. And the basic thing was friendly, inviting, transparent, warm, a place for everybody. Three of the judges, we had... Uh, Charles Correa from India, United States, Jeffrey Bauer, uh, Peter Davey from, from the UK, fantastic people from abroad, alive, uh, alert, excited by the project. But three of the South Africans had been political prisoners. Two had been locked up in that prison. They weren't put on the jury because they'd been locked up, but we found out incidentally, Dan Jim Tinsu from the Gender Commission had spent seven months in solitary confinement. She said, what kind of building should this be? She said, I'm my mother, I'm my sister. I'm from a rural area. Her mother was a washerwoman who took in laundry so that her children could go to school. And I'm coming to the Constitutional Court. What kind of a building do I want to be in? She put herself in their shoes. And she and I fought the hardest for the most adventurous building. And Peter Davy said afterwards, it's the best jury he's ever been on. Because normally on a jury, the professionals fight amongst themselves and the lay people line up on the one side or the other, usually backing the less interesting uh, project. In this case, the leadership came from the lay people. We went for the most exciting project, the one that we felt captured the spirit, the feeling that was rooted in South Africa, that was imaginative. Uh, we couldn't quite see the building. It didn't have a profile. It didn't have a clear outline. It, it had an internal character and a descriptive poetic quality that we felt this is right. And the little sketches and the drawings and the details were enough to convince us. Now I'm going to conclude with just, I think it's about 
quickly five areas of tussle between us. And some, if it was a football game, I'm not sure who would win. We'd probably have to go to penalties. Uh, some, we, the judges won, and some, the architects won. And they'll be interested to know what I think they are. <laughs> uh, the one that turned out not to be difficult was, the, and, but it'll be news to you, this idea that the very democratic, very appealing, very uh, sensitive to the site, to the history, to the place, to the topography building that you had, needed something extra, a little more gravitas and a little bit more of a landmark feature. It wasn't just a community center, it was the constitutional court. And we'd said we didn't want a high building, it had to be a low, flat, accessible building, no judge should have to walk more than one flight to get to the court. You don't take a lift to get to court, you walk to court. It affects the serenity of your head when you just walk to court. And that was all done. And the identifying features, and they came up with the most brilliant solution, which we could never have thought of, and that was to keep four staircases from the awaiting trial block, which was the only precious building that had to be demolished. They'd already accepted the idea to reuse the bricks from that building inside, inside the court. But now it was to keep these four staircases as landmarks, as sentinels, and to build high towers of light on them so that it would stand out at night. We've only done one, because we ran out of money for the other three, and whenever I take people on tours, I say they've got to be very high and very bright, because the Church of the Latter-day Saints on the hillside across the way are very beautiful spires, and ours have got to be at least as beautiful and at least as bright as, as theirs. The doors. The original idea was to have uh, porcelain and, and steel, if I remember correctly, which would have fitted in very well with a certain uh, sort of a material integrity of the building. And you can do a lot with porcelain and steel. And we judges said, no, it's too cold. We want wooden doors. Wood is, is in a more emotional, a warmer a more textured thing. And remember, there's a lot of concrete and beautifully used open uh, concrete all over the building. We just felt it's got to be softened a bit and lots of use of timber inside. And this is one to us, because we insisted on the wood. But then look what they did. They had a competition and they came up with the idea of panels, carved wooden panels, uh, using sign language to represent themes from our Bill of Rights. It's visually wonderful, this tall, tall, tall door, but it's emotionally so powerful. You see the sign language, the hands, the human hands, representing themes from the fundamental rights that everybody has. You go inside and you see slanting pillars. We call them the pious pillars. Slanting pillars angled pillars in a courtroom. My colleague Pius Lange, who's now the Chief Justice, was very, very alarmed. And Janina and Andrew, Andy, dug in their heels. I'm not sure what it would have happened if, if it had come to an absolute showdown. But you were absolutely firm and you were absolutely right. So that's a big, a big score in this kind of, of tussle. And I give these examples, it was always a friendly engagement, but to indicate it was an ongoing all the way through. The basic scheme, the idea and so on clearly was theirs, but the features and particularly the features that involved the judges most directly in terms of our working uh, were ones where we were a little more insistent. I was trying to raise funds for the artwork. Initially it was just me and what was quite marvelous was the enthusiasm of the creative community in South Africa. Because with nothing, with no money, but the belief in democracy, the belief in the idea of public art, we assembled, or an extraordinary collection assembled itself, and it's in the building. That was the loose art. The much more exciting part was the integrated artwork, like the door that I've mentioned, like the uh, mosaics on, on the pillars, like the carpets, we've got the most astonishing carpets, like the, the, the security doors 
of beautifully wrought metal screens. We had competitions for that. And in order to get some money for this, because we couldn't go to the private sector in South Africa, and government gave the money you need for a building, but not for all these little extras and topping up, uh, I would go speaking on speaking tours in North America, and I said, give me an image. Give me an icon. Give me something I can put on, you know, when you rattle the tin cup, you want something that people can look at. And they said no. And they were right. They said, we can't reduce this building to an icon and an image. It's a building that will start articulating itself. It will end up. And even to this day, it's very hard. We're producing books on the, on the building. It's hard to find a either a definitive or such an intensely symbolical representation that we feel this captures what the building's all about. And you were right. The very last one is the library, and there I think it was a wonderful meeting of the two. The projections you made for the library, and it, it, it's quite a, an extraordinary uh, sort of, not a spiral, I'm not sure what the geometrical shape is, because it doesn't have the circular thing of a spiral, but it's on like a Guggenheim principle, knowledge floating, uh, ideas, the place itself is a wonderful place to be in, and the design of the bookshelves would have been aesthetically maybe a little more exciting, but somehow for people wanting to be in a library, we insisted on more wood, and Kate O'Regan, my colleague, and the other judges were very, very insistent, and a kind of an amalgam emerged of their ideas and our ideas that's been very, very special. So it's simply to say it, it's been a, a wonderfully exciting uh, collaboration, interaction. At times we put our feet down, at times they dig in their heels but very, very interactive because we trust one another, we believe in the process, and we all come from the same, we belong to the same community, if you like, the community of creative people, whether it's in thinking and in law or in creating spaces and buildings, uh, involved in establishing democracy in South Africa and seeing democracy as something that liberates and frees, uh, opens up new energies, not something that is simply formal and routine. And the one thing that this building is not is formal and routine. Thank you.